Uh, yeah, we are going through this series at the moment called Joy to the World. We, had, uh, uh, we started this last week going through Mary's song and over four different, uh, four different services we'll be going through this series. Uh, this series is going through the first couple of chapters of the book of Luke and all of these, uh, these different sermons are based around four different songs that happen in the first two chapters of Luke. And these four different songs happen because people are bursting with joy. They are so, um, so joyful because the Messiah is going to come. They are expectant for what is going to happen. The Christ, the one who has been prophesied for thousands of years, is now about to come to earth. And we began this last week with Mary's song, and Mary's song has a deep sense of personal joy about what is happening in her life. She is the one who is going to be giving birth to this Christ, this Messiah. This is what we celebrate every single Christmas, that Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. And in Mary, we see this overflowing, this over, this uh, outbursting of joy that, uh, that comes within her for herself personally. But the joy that Jesus brings isn't just for Mary or just for one individual person. It's not a just a personal joy, but it's a joy that goes out to the whole world and we see this happening in every single song, that there is joy not meant just for one person or one nation or one group, but a joy that was meant for the entire world. So what that song that we sing is based around, joy to the entire world. And we see more and more glimpses of this uh, in every single one of these songs. Uh, every single one of these songs, they are here because the person is rejoicing, bursting with joy. They are wanting to praise God for what he is doing in that moment. And this joy that they're experiencing, it's not the same as the joy that we usually experience around Christmas at f about food or presents or family or anything like that, but the joy is around Jesus Christ, the Messiah who is about to come. The writer of this gospel account um, of the gospel of Luke, funnily enough, is Luke. He is the, uh, the gospel writer of this, uh, of this account, and he is also the person who writes the book of Acts. These two books are two parts of the one, uh, the one story that, uh, that Luke here is trying to communicate. Um, the book of Luke and Acts, they are historical accounts of what happened throughout the life of Jesus and then into the early church. And, uh, and this, this man, Luke, he spent a huge amount of time with Paul. Luke actually contributes the most to the New Testament, um, and then Paul contributes the second most. Uh, Luke was Paul's physician and spent a huge amount of time both being his physician, but also sharing the gospel with Paul uh, during the early church. So uh, this physician, Luke, he is a very well educated person for this time. He is someone who, um, who has great knowledge uh, and, and because of this, uh, he takes a certain slant on the way that he communicates his gospel accounts. The way that, uh, that Luke uh, communicates his gospel account is primarily wanting to communicate the historical events as they happened. This is different probably from, uh, from other gospel accounts. For example, in the gospel of John, John begins his gospel account by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's almost poetic the way that John begins his gospel account. But Luke takes the, uh, uh, takes the approach of wanting to list historical events that happened in the order that they happened. In the very first paragraph of Luke uh, chapter 1, we see these words where he's really trying to communicate this to who it was written to, which is Theophilus. I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, to Theophilus. Now, the reason that this is important for us to know, particularly for our time here this morning, is because the song that we're going to be looking at this morning is not just about 
the song, but there is a huge amount of, uh, of different historical events that happen in the lead up to this song. In the first part of this gospel account, after that intro that we first saw, we come to this important historical figure in this gospel called Zechariah. Later on, we're going to be looking at the song that Zechariah sings. And this man, Zechariah, becomes almost the key player throughout all of chapter 1. This man, Zechariah, he was a significant priest uh, during this time. Uh, and uh, during ver- uh, in verses um, 5 to 7, we see a little bit more detail about who Zechariah was. He was married to uh, Elizabeth, and both uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were a fair bit older. That is quite important to, uh, to what we hear about later on. Um, Zechariah was a priest and a fairly significant priest, uh, and he was given the opportunity to be able to enter into the temple. This was a very, very high honour to receive, being able to enter into the temple at this time. This meant entering into the presence of God and encountering God in a, uh, in a really powerful way. Uh, when Zechariah entered into the temple, we see this throughout chapter 1, um, Zechariah then uh, encounters an angel, the angel Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel gives him this word and tells him, you are going to have a child. Even in your old age, you and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a son and you are going to call him John. Uh, this seems to happen quite a bit, I've noticed, throughout Scripture. Is, uh, is, um, yeah, God seems to show up in these ways and uh, give people children when they, when they weren't expecting them. And Zechariah, he can't believe it. He can't believe what is happening uh, in this moment. And uh, because he doesn't believe what Gabriel is saying to him, Gabriel tells him, you won't be able to talk uh, until uh, the time that John is circumcised. There's a strange series of events that we see here. Firstly, uh, that that Zechariah, this this older priest, is going to be having a child, but also that uh, that he has been told to call his son John. This is not a family name for them at the time, which would have been an extremely a strange thing for him to do. And so following this, he walks out of the temple and everyone's confused about what he's seen. He can't tell anyone what has happened. His mouth is not able to work. He can't talk at all. And for nine, a little bit over nine months, uh, he is totally silent and only able to communicate to people through what he writes down. This is the only way that he's able to tell people what is happening uh, in, uh, in this moment. Sitting in silence, not able to tell anyone what is happening. After uh, John is born, this, uh, this man who we later know as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, uh, following this, he is, uh, John is circumcised. And in this moment, the moment that Zechariah writes down, his name will be John, suddenly his his mouth is able to work again. He's able to talk again. But he doesn't burst out in just talking. He begins rejoicing, praising, singing to God for what is happening here. And we see this in verses 64 to 66. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free. And he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was on him. Everyone around at this time, they know that there is something significant about Zechariah's son, who we would later know as John the Baptist. There are so many Um, interesting events that happen around the birth of John the Baptist and what happens around Zechariah. This would have been an unusual thing for the other priests who worked with Zechariah, that Zechariah walks into the temple and then walks out and suddenly is not able to say a thing. And then 
Following this, his wife, who is quite elderly, suddenly falls pregnant. And then they decide to call this son John. All of these different things are, are interesting events surrounding the, uh, the, um, the birth of, of John the Baptist. This song that we're going to be looking at that comes um, later on in verses 65 and onwards, uh, Zechariah's song is often called the Benedictus, and it is very different than the other songs that we're going to be looking at in one key way that we see before the song even begins Uh, In this one line, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. It could seem like a really quick line to just jump over. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. In all the other songs, the way that that they are introduced is, uh, is it's written that the person praised the Lord saying... Or it says they sung with joy or they, they praised God. It's, uh, it says some of these, these sorts of words. But here in this song for Zechariah, it says Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. The reason that I think this is so significant is because of what prophecy really is. Uh, throughout the New Testament, there are at least three different spiritual gifts that are used as, uh, as communicating a message from God. There's probably others as well, but I'm just going to focus on these three, which are words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and prophecy. Now, um, words of wisdom and words of knowledge, some of you may have this, this spiritual gift. Uh, all these gifts are, are still available for the church today. Um, the words of wisdom and words of knowledge is a little bit like playing Chinese whispers with God. So God gives you a, a message. He whispers something to you. There is something that you hear from, from God. And then your role then is to communicate to someone or communicate into a situation. This is what I, I believe. This is what I have a sense that God is saying here to you right now or to this situation right now. Now, uh, now that's, what, um, that's the best way of understanding words of knowledge or words of, of wisdom. It's a little bit like Chinese whispers, but the best way of understanding something like prophecy is God decides to get rid of the middleman. And he doesn't just whisper something into your ear. He takes over your mouth and starts moving it up and down and actually controls what you are saying. The words that you begin to say are the literal words of God himself. He is wanting to speak something incredibly specific through a person. And in this moment, we begin to see Zechariah who has been silent for over nine months and God has something incredible that he wants to say in this moment, something specific that he wants to say. When, uh, uh, when Zechariah begins to, to prophesy, we begin to see that there are, um, there are, the people around are speaking about what he is prophesying about. All of these different moments that Zechariah, this significant priest who encounters an angel, can't speak for nine months has a baby even though his wife is incredibly, uh, is incredibly old. He's able to speak again and his first words are prophecy from God. Because of all of these different things together, everyone is amazed at what's going on. They begin to speak about it there in their, uh, in their communities. The thing I find amazing when I look at all of these different events that surround the birth of John the Baptist is all of these events are quite fantastic. These are incredible things that surround uh, the birth of of John the Baptist. And because of these fantastic events, everyone around is speaking about them. This contrasts the birth of of Jesus, where even though there are fantastic events that happen, yes, there are angels that worship Jesus, there are shepherds, there is a, a star, there are all of these different things around the birth of Jesus... It is quite a a simple birth that happens with Jesus in this town of Bethlehem in an inn. So 
why was John the Baptist's birth so significant? Why did God choose to make this man's birth significant and have everyone speaking about these events? And we see in the song, from verse 76, in the second half of the song, which is split into two different sections, the second half is around what John the Baptist is going to do. And you, my child, you will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. John had all of these events surrounding his birth, and he grew up being someone who was talked about People were wondering, what is the significance around this person? Later on, we, we see that people were saying, John, he must be the, uh, the Messiah. He must be the one who has is, who is come. But what we see that, uh, that John's reaction is, is that his, his role is to point to Jesus, to prepare the way for the Lord. He doesn't exist to have people pointing to him as awesome or amazing. His job is to point to Jesus. And because people saw all of these events surrounding the birth of John the Baptist, he was given the ability to prepare the way for the Lord, to preach this message, repent, turn back to God. He was able to do this. And then when Jesus came, he was able to point to Christ. Recently, um, just, uh, just over the past week or so, my wife and I, we were watching The Crown. Does anyone here watch The Crown? It's, um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's not a bad thing to, uh, to put on, on, on Netflix. Um, if you start The Crown, skip the first three seasons and go to straight to season four. It's far more, far more interesting. <laughs> Some people don't agree. There are uh, significant moments that happen throughout this, um, throughout this show. It's about the royal family, particularly um, around uh, the life of, of Queen Elizabeth. Um, but there are uh, significant moments that you see throughout, um, throughout this show that, uh, that help you understand the mindset of what it means to be part of uh, this, this royal family. Um, and in particular, there's one conversation that I saw happen between uh, Prince Philip um, and Princess Diana in the fourth season. Um, they are having a conversation about what it means to be a royal and the type of attitude that you need to have. And there is a quote that um, both shocked me and, uh, yeah, it, it shocked and surprised me. And it, uh, it says this, it'll be there on the screen as well. Philip says this to Diana, there is one person, speaking of the queen, only one person that matters. She's the oxygen we all breathe, the essence of all our duty. While this quote is being read out, it shows some of the other royals who need to uh, live with this attitude. It shows... um, uh, shows images of Prince Charles and Princess Anne and the others, who I can't remember all of their, all of their names. Um, but it shows different images of these different royals, and it shows this it's almost emptiness that they feel within their life because their life is based around pointing to this person. Then you also begin to see the face of the, the queen who has this heaviness upon her, where everyone else is putting this weight on her, where they're saying that she is the oxygen that we all breathe. She is the essence of all of our duty. When we point to anyone who is not Jesus, whether it is another person or ourselves, this robs us of the joy that we were made to experience. But when we do what we were created to do, 
when we do what John the Baptist was created to do. John the Baptist was there to point to Christ who was going to come. We are then filled with the joy that we were made to experience. John the Baptist, he understood that the reason that he had been created wasn't to point to just a person and say that this person is the essence of all of my duty, but to point to Christ, the Messiah, the one who had been prophesied for thousands of years and say, this person is the one who is going to bring salvation. This is the person who is going to bring hope and joy for all of humanity. And this, in turn, increases our joy when we choose to point to the person who is worthy. Not pointing to ourselves or another person, but pointing to Christ, which is what John does. Just before this, just before we... Um, just before we see what the role of John the Baptist was, which was to point people to, uh, to Christ and prepare the way of the Lord, we see what Christ had come to do. Uh, at the beginning of this song, when, uh, when Zechariah begins to prophesy, he says this, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy on our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days." Part of the rejoicing that happened in so many people around the birth of Jesus and the expectation that was happening around the Messiah coming was because they had been under Roman rule for uh, quite a significant time uh, by this stage. And being under Roman rule, there were, uh, there were moments that they had family members who had been killed by the empire at this time. They were taxed ruthlessly. Uh, and it was a difficult situation that the uh, that God's people found themselves under uh, during this time. And the expectation was that this Messiah was going to be the person who would bring about a new earthly kingdom of Israel. They would reign and rule this earthly physical kingdom. I think that might need to be checked, Dave. Thanks, mate. Uh, that this earthly kingdom was, uh, was going to be ruled. But what we see here for, um, for God's people is, uh, is that it was not going to be a nation any longer that was going to be um, ruled, but, uh, but whoever placed their trust in Christ, this was going to become God's people. This is who is now defined as God's people, not a nation or a group, but God's people. And as part of God's people, we see here some of the... Um, the things that God has for those of us who have placed our, tr- our trust in him. Later on, uh, later on we, we see these words in the, sec- in the first half of the, uh, of the song, which says this, that for God's people, he redeems, he brings salvation, he keeps his promises, he brings help from enemies, he shows mercy, he rescues, he enables us to serve him without fear. All of these things, when we look at them together, it shows us that for those of us who are in relationship with Christ, for those of us who are God's people, his children, we have a special place in God's heart. Often it's spoken about that those who are um, not with Christ, those who are lost, they have a special place in God's heart, which is totally true. Those who don't know him do have a special place in God's heart, but those of us who are his children, those of us who have a relationship with him, we have a special place in in his heart. Those who have been redeemed, who he has brought salvation to, he keeps his promises to us, brings help for us from from our enemies, shows us mercy, rescues us, and enables us to serve him without fear. And when we see both of these things in this song together, that we have this special place in the heart of God, but also that we have been created 
to point to someone greater than ourselves, then we are able to rejoice, to be joyful. This is what Zechariah is singing about. This is part of the reason that he is rejoicing because of these two different aspects of what he sings about. That John had been created to point to Jesus, which is exactly the same as why we have been created to point to Jesus. But also that we have, um, that we as God's people here in Australia in 2020, we have a special place in God's heart. This brings us joy this leads us to rejoicing as Zechariah did for those of you here this morning who are not feeling joyful you might be here this morning and uh and this series might just feel a bit heavy for you because you're not feeling uh, a great sense of joy about what's going on in your your life right now some of you may be in this first camp where you need to just Rest in the fact that God has a special place in his heart for you. All of these different things that we listed just before, these are things that God has done for you as his child. He loves you deeply and you are able to rest in that. But some of you, you may, you may realize that, but you, you may have forgotten that, uh, that you, you were created to point to someone greater Not to point to yourself or another person, but to point to Christ, the Messiah, the one who came to bring all of us joy. With both of these together, we are able to experience the joy that uh, God created us for. Let's pray together. Yeah, God, it is an incredible joy that you do give us. Help us to rest in that Lord, your love that you have for us, this unconditional love that you have for us, your children. That you've called each of us by name to be part of your family. For any of my brothers and sisters who might be having this sense this morning that they somehow need to work their way up to to being right with you, would you remind them that in relationship with you, they are so deeply loved. Loved enough that you have chosen to redeem them, to bring salvation, to keep your promises, Lord. And God, for anyone who is maybe not experiencing joy because they are not pointing to the joy giver, you fix our attention back on you. God, for all my brothers and sisters here, increase our joy. (laughs) Increase our love for you, our King Jesus. And know that it's only through doing that that we are able to experience the joy that you have to give us. In Jesus' name, amen.